also welcome those uh, joining on the online service. We are a congregation of the Presbyterian Church USA, uh, located at 1095, 9500 Bell Road in Johns Creek, uh, just off Medlock Bridge. Uh, those of you in the sanctuary, please, if you would, uh, use the friendship register that's on the inside end of each of the pews and uh, give us your contact information there and pass it along as it needs to do so. Um, I commend, I think you all have your worship bulletin, uh, the announcements that are in there. I commend all of them to you. We have our annual mission week coming up the second week of June, and there is a sign-up available for that online. As ever, your pastors and today's Stephen Minister David Lee will be available as you retire from the worship service for prayer or counsel. Uh, if you look for an index card in the bulletin today, over these next number of weeks we'll be gathering prayer requests for the prayer vigil. So please be thinking about those uh, in your family, the needs in our nation or world, uh, uh, and uh, uh, fill those in, and you can put them in the prayer box in the Welcome Center or in the Offering Bowl. Uh, today is the fifth Sunday. No, no, it's not. It's the sixth Sunday of Easter. That was last week, Jim. Uh, the sixth Sunday of Easter. Our call is to give, go, live with hope. What does it mean for us to be encountered by the Jesus who comes to assure us that we are loved and that we are to go and love? How might we live that out in the world? As you're able, would you please stand and we'll all join to sing the verse of the intro printed in the bulletin. Uh, and I've forgotten about chiming the time, haven't I? Yeah, it's the second week nerves. That's, that's all that is. Uh, will we do that or will we just sing? We'll just sing. Uh, uh, Christ is risen, shout Hosanna. People, praise our God, the artist of creation, the Lord of heaven and earth. We worship our Maker with praise. In God we live and move and have our being. It is the Lord who gives us life and breath. God has kept us among the living and not let our feet slip. God formed all people to seek the Lord. Indeed, our Creator is never far away. Bless the Lord, who is faithful to us.
the Holy Spirit, the Advocate, gives us the words we need to speak. Jesus Christ Himself prays for us. We need not fear sharing our failings with the one who abides with us and in us. With the confidence of the children of God, let us confess our sin to God and before one another. First, in just a few moments of our own silent prayers, and then when invited, we will pray together using the words in the bulletin. So let us pray. And as the church, we say together, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, you said, and in the same breath you promised an advocate would come to us. You, Lord, were faithful to your promise, but we, we have broken your law of love. We have hoarded resources rather than feeding your sheep. We have stoked competition rather than kneeling at others' feet. We have kept silent rather than testifying to our belief, for not showing our love for you by loving one another. Forgive us. Help us obey your commandments and keep us ever faithful to your word by the power of your Spirit who abides with and among us. Amen. Sisters and brothers, God forgives, restores, and strengthens us through the risen Christ. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. The peace of Christ be with you. Let us offer to one another a sign of the peace of Christ. Good morning and happy Mother's Day. Our scripture reading is from 1 Peter. I'll be reading Peter chapters, chapter 3, verses 13 through 22. I invite you all to follow along with me using the words printed in your bulletin. Let us listen for God's word to us this morning. <clears throat> now, who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for, what, for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear, and do not be intimidated. But in your hearts, sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Maintain a good conscience so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you, for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if suffering should be God's will, than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison who in former times did not obey when God patiently waited in the days of Noah during the building of the ark in which a few, that is eight lives, were saved through water. 
and baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. Imagine who it is, can you? Who do you think it is? Go on. High school. What, what is Jesus? And Jesus has two children. Now, I acknowledge that the shades of these skin colors are not what we might do if we were making these figures today. Thankfully, they would be much darker if we made it today. But I was given this when I first immigrated to the United States by the preschool at Northminster Presbyterian Church. And so for my very first children's sermon, it, I, as the new pastor at Northminster, I used this set of figures to remind all of us that day, as I do today, that with Jesus there's a welcome for all children. And if you would look around you, every person here today and everyone on the online service, they are all children. We all have a place with Jesus. He said, come to me and I'm not going to turn you away. You are loved for me. There's at least one person in the congregation this morning that might have been at that children's sermon. Clay Boyles, welcome. It's good to see you. Uh, so remember always that there's a welcome at the front of the church any time you walk up here and that there's a welcome for each and all of you in the love of God in Jesus 
our Saviour. We'll say a prayer together if we might. I'll let you all repeat it after me. Thank you, God, Thank you, God. for your welcome to us. Us. In Jesus our Saviour. Savior. Help us. Help us. Extend that welcome. Extend that welcome. Everywhere. Everywhere. Amen. Amen. I tricked them into there. (laughs) Our second scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John, the 14th chapter. Let us listen for God's word to us. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I'm coming to you. In a little while the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God.
please be seated. One day in the Peanuts character uh, cartoon, Charlie Brown and Lucy get into an interesting debate about defining the word love. You know what I don't understand, Lucy posed to Charlie Brown, I don't understand love. Charlie responded with unusual wisdom, who does? Unsatisfied with Charlie Brown's answer, Lucy decided to push him verbally. Explain love to me, Charlie Brown. In his own defense, Charlie replied, I can't explain love. I, I can recommend a book or a poem or a painting, but I cannot explain love. Lucy, in her usual way, now growing miffed and impatient, insisted, well, try, Charlie Brown, try. Charlie, as valiantly as he knew how, struggled with his assignment. Well, let's say I see this cute little girl walk by. Lucy immediately interrupts, why does she have to be cute, huh? Why can't someone fall in love with someone with freckles and a big nose? Explain that, Charlie Brown. Regrouping, Charlie replies, well, maybe you're right. Let's just say this girl walks by with this great big nose. I didn't say great big nose, Charlie Brown. By now, Charlie Brown has had enough. He's become quite exasperated, and it shows with a sigh in his response, you not only can't explain love, you can't even talk about it. Well, on this Mother's Day, we can, we will, we must look to talk about love in order that we might then go and love. So, we'll all listen up for what God might say with us and to us and for us this morning. The passage that Brian read for us in the Gospel of John picks up exactly where we left off reading last Sunday. We are still, remember, in the upper room where Jesus is gathered in the aftermath of washing the disciples' feet. In the aftermath of Judas' departure, Jesus is there, and He's been responding to the disciples' fears and hopes, seeking to direct them beyond their anxiety and alarm to trust and love. The room is cracking with emotion. It's bursting with anxiety. It's overflowing with fear. One result is that these words of Jesus about love are not to be heard or read as a meditative sermon or prepared remarks. Instead, these are words in the rough coming from deep within Jesus in response to all that is coming from deep within the disciples. Jesus' words are marked with raw emotion, seeking to assure and reassure the disciples of one of the most basic human hopes, a sense of belonging. Jesus goes out of His way to assure the disciples that even in His leaving them, His love for them will persist. I will not leave you as orphans. It is in this troubling context that Jesus enjoins love upon the disciples. Jesus enjoins them to love God, love neighbor. Love for Jesus means to love God and neighbor. Love for God, neighbor. The word translated in the NRSV as if in Greek can also mean when. So, yes, while the text can be translated, if you love me, it is just as correct to translate it, when you love me, you will keep my commandments. Jesus is assuring, begging, all in one breath, when you love me, 
when you receive my love for you, you will keep my commandments as you live for others. This is the way I have for you to follow, to love, and so be loved, to be loved, and so to love. By the time the Gospel of John comes into its almost final format, the latest of our four New Testament Gospels to do so, the language of the church concerning Jesus Christ and what it means to be a follower of of Jesus is most fully given voice in Jesus' expression, love. Love. Love for Jesus, love for God, love for one another, love for neighbor. And this is the way that Christians and the church have understood Jesus and sought to live down through all the generations. And so it is that we also understand ourselves as a church and as Christians to be all about love. To be Christian is all about love. As friends and followers of our Lord, we love without limit. To be in Christ is to love. To live in Christ is to love. Love is our innermost and key motivation, and love is our outgoing action and attitude. Love is our way, our truth, our life, because love is who we see and what we encounter in our Savior. Love is the essence of all we are and might and need to be as the people of Jesus. Love is who God is. And love is the fullest reality of who God needs us to be and how God asks and expects and needs us to live. We are to love, urged, commanded to love God. God who is love means that to love God means loving love lovingly. Loving love lovingly means loving fully and practically, meaning that none are orphaned that all are embraced and loved. The object of the command, those to be loved, be it God or neighbor, and the subject of the command, those who love, become, as they love, the reality of the command. That is, they become love. This is who, who we know Jesus to be, love in the flesh. And this gifts us our calling to lovingly follow. The only context within which we exist as a church is love. The only climate that we can help us thrive in our faith is love. The soil in which we grow in every way is love. The only foundation upon which we can build as Christian people and as a Christian community is love. From first to last, from top to bottom, from beginning to end, from start to finish, from birth to death, from doubt to faith, love is. And love is all we need. Jesus' new commandment to us, Jesus' disciples, was precisely this. Show your love, love one another. By your love, they will know more about me than by anything else you could do. Love each other as I have loved you, says Jesus. And we know Jesus didn't love us by simply feeling loving towards us. Jesus lived a life that embodied love as Jesus healed the sick and fed the hungry and comforted the confused and taught the ignorant, and hugged the little children. Jesus' love was so great that He bore on the cross all the hurt and pain and death of the world, all overcome by Jesus' love. The love that Jesus wants His disciples enter into, not just to feel, is action-packed, And love in action is sometimes embodied by the simplest of compassionate responses. As Jesus has loved you, me, all the baptized, we are asked to enter into that love that marks the relationship 
between God and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And in that love, the love of the triune God to engage the world with the gospel that is not just words, but love in action. I loved my mom for many reasons, but in part because she was always ready to welcome into our home anyone who showed up with me. She would especially like it if she could cook them a hearty meal and see them leave well-filled and maybe with a little extra to take home with them. There is a good chance that some of you loved your mom for this very same reason. She welcomed you and all those reprobate friends that you brought home with you. And she made you and them breakfast or lunch or dinner or her special cookies or whatever it was she loved to cook or bake. Some of you love or loved your mom in part because she was or is always waiting for you to come home. She waited for you from the school bus or when you came home from college or from the dance or from a war or from somewhere far away. Even after you moved away from home or got married or found a partner or made a life of your own, somehow when you were back home, Mom still acted like you had never left. Some of you loved or love your mom because she encouraged you forward by her encouragement or advice, by her tenacity or sheer hard work, opening opportunities for you that she had never had for herself, and you would never have had them except for her push and sacrifice and love. Some of you loved or love your mother because she provided you by her attitude and example with deeper and growing and lasting faith and an attitude of service to others and a passion for your own faith. We rejoice with those who today on this Mother's Day rejoice in such memories and experiences even as we mourn with those who, for any manner of reasons, never knew such experiences. And we're grateful for all the women in our lives who cared for us and loved us and advised us and taught us and nudged us and challenged us to thrive in our lives. Their love led us forward. Let me tell you the story of a true Presbyterian miracle. A pastor came back to church one Sunday after the death of his wife. He arrived for the early service. This was a change from the pattern he and his late wife Nancy had followed. He thought there'd be people there he knew to sit with, but he misjudged and arrived 15 minutes early the way preachers do. He sat alone in the center of a pew, two empty pews behind him and three empty pews in front, a brave, sad, solitary man. But then the miracle happened. Two members slid out of their pews, six rows behind him, and quietly moved down the aisle and slipped in and sat beside him. Do you hear the miracle? Two Presbyterians left their pew <laughs> and moved six pews forward <laughs> to share love to be there, to be with, to sing, surround, to engage, to embrace. That's a miracle. That's love. Love commands such miracles in your life. Love commands such miracles 
in the life of your church. As we engage in what it means for us to be together today and in the future, love commands that we welcome all people, that we reach out to others regardless of who they are or where they've come from or what they look like. Love commands us to be faithful in our personal and corporate discipleship, living out our faith in every part of our living. Love commands us to adjust and adapt and reform some of the ways we do things in order that we can more fully together express the love and faith that we surely share. Love commands us to be willing to offer to God our lives. Love commands us to be serious about living under the Lordship of Jesus, the King of love. Ultimately, the church is not just another voluntary association. We have been brought together into existence in and by God's love for us in Jesus Christ, and ultimately we need to be true to that birthright as we seek to follow love's command. You do that, we do that at Johns Creek through all the ongoing mission and outreach programs. You'll do it in the upcoming Mission Week, June 11 through 17, promises and opportunities to love neighbors through promise 686, an improvement at the preschool playground through hands of Christ or habitat and the men's shelter and maybe some others. I want to end with just one more way that my mom taught me about love. If she ever saw someone at church who got too full of themselves, somebody who could quote the Bible, someone who presented themselves as extremely spiritual but whose daily life seemed to my mom to miss the mark, she would say of them, oh, don't worry about them. They're too heavenly-minded to be any earthly good. We go today to love to recognize not our goodness but God's goodness, to express the heavenly love in every way, in every earthly way possible. We go today to love, to be rightly heavenly-minded, and to be ready to do every earthly good. May it be so. Amen. I was reminded this week that the lowest crime rate day of the year every year is always Mother's Day. All days should honor mothers and the wisdom that they give us. When we are taught at a young age that we are to pray with one another, it is often by our mothers. And in that same spirit, let us go to God in prayer. Lord, you have given us your word and your son. In your word, you love us as a mother bear loves her cubs, and you will always protect us. You tell us you look for us like the sheep that is sought after by their shepherd, like the coin that's sought after by the widow. As your son wept over Jerusalem, he told us that he longs to gather us as a hen gathers her brood. On Mother's Day, we celebrate all of those who mother, as you and Christ mother us, as Mary mothered till the very end, as church mothers mothered the church into existence with house churches and adopted the widows and orphans, as people in this church mother women in need of mentors and the young people of our church and youth programs by their gentle care, by meal preparation, teaching lessons in their countless hours of time and affection. Lord, we acknowledge that today is also a very hard day. Some of us have difficult relationships with our mothers or don't know who they are or have been abused by mothers. Some of us long to be mothers and have struggled with infertility, with miscarriage and the loss of children and adult children. Some of us choose not to be mothers and have been given a hard time for this, even though they mother in other ways in our community. 
Some of us have lost our mothers or mothering figures recently or still feel those losses keenly. Lord, in the midst of our struggles, remind us by your spirit that you comfort all who suffer, that you gather us like a hen and protect us like the mother bear. When we experience the brokenness of this day, restore us to health and wholeness. Wipe our tears, hold us close, and give us your example of motherly tenderness. As we pray to you in gratitude for good mothers, help us to mother well, to seek the lost like the widow and celebrate with everyone in the finding. Help us to be good mothers and fathers as we pray the prayer that your son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. at your hands. Recall all the ways we help each other with our hands. All the ways in which we live out our calling to help our neighbors in need. At Presbyterian Homes of Georgia, hands literally and symbolically are essential parts of our ministry of charitable care. There are more than 700 pairs of hands that serve with compassion the more than 1,300 residents across the state who wake up each morning in the six Presbyterian homes of Georgia communities. As has been the case now for more than three decades, an offering is being collected to help provide funds for the Caring Hands Fund. Each year, Caring Hands dollars are used to help residents with meal assistance to address food insecurities, to provide rides to appointments, and to fund programs that ensure the medical, mental, and spiritual health of our residents. Caring Hands also assists with medical bills and devices that residents might otherwise be unable to afford. Today's Caring Hands offering ensures that our neediest residents will have the quality of life and exceptional care that you would want for you or your family member. Over a third of our residents depend upon all our caring hearts and hands. A gift, your gift, your hands, our hands. Hand in hand, come together in and through the Caring Hands Fund to provide benevolent care for our most vulnerable residents. Please join your hands with our hands again this year.
we pray together. O oh, loving God, we give you thanks that you have placed in the hearts of your faithful people the gift of generosity and the desire to keep your commands. Bless these gifts and use them to reveal to all tribes, nations, and peoples your love in Jesus Christ. Amen. The affirmation of faith is the Apostles' Creed. Together we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Sisters, brothers, God has heard you and given heed to your prayers. Therefore, go in peace to serve Christ and always be eager to do what is good. May God, who creates, redeems, and sustains, keep you steadfast in faith, buoyant in hope, and abounding in love. And the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.